It's the 21st century. Why are you still talking about the Alamo? Texas Revolution was all about slavery. Racism, 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 racism. Diversity, diversity, diversity. Exceptionalism's not real. So who's preaching this load of bullshit? Mm -hmm. Fellow Texans, I present to you your Texas history professors. To understand how Texas history ended up in the hands of postmodernists, let's start at the beginning, or somewhere near the beginning. The year was 1990. George Herbert Walker Bush was president. Germany got back together. Kuwait sort of hooked up with Iraq. The Iron Lady stepped down. Bill Clements was governor of Texas again. And over in Aggieland, something rotten was cooking. Okay, so that's A&M like 100 years ago. The students at A&M, when all this was going on, probably looked a little bit more like this. So back in 1990, a crack commando unit of historians from across the state of Texas convened at Texas A&M. They met and discussed what they perceived as problems with how Texas history is viewed by the public and how it was taught in our schools. A series of essays was published after that conference. The title of the series, Preparing for Texas in the 21st Century. Sounds like a real page turner, doesn't it? Well, rest easy, my friend. I read it, so you don't have to. One of these essays, written by two Aggie history professors, Robert Calvert and Walter Binger, laid out a plan to bring new social history to Texas. Essentially, rewriting history from the viewpoint of the so-called little guy and minority groups, avoiding focus on big events and larger-than-life heroes who were mostly, you know, too male, and too white. Here's how Calvert and Binger described the new social history movement. Now they could have just said they were going to Howard Zinn the frick out of the Texas story and left it at that, but that wouldn't be very academic, would it? By the late 1960s, proponents of an anti-establishment history, a new social history, took the intellectual high ground, a position they've held ever since. Its practitioners generally argue that the ethnicity, culture, and actions of non-elites shape society with near equal force of that of elite groups. These historians tend to look at group actions, not the actions of individuals. I'm all for adding to our historical knowledge. Add individuals of consequence. Discuss cultures and group migrations and population groups. Whatever is well documented should be told regardless of the immutable characteristics of the players. But why would the professoriate want to downplay major events and individuals and focus instead on nebulous group actions? Why eliminate our heroes as we know them and as we need them? The answer, in my words, is virtue signaling to gain clout and job security by following trends. But I'll give you the answer in their words, too. Warning! I'm about to share with you some very boring academic writing. Go make yourself a big cup of coffee and listen up. Don't say I didn't warn you. This is the why of our story. It's what the professors thought was wrong with Texas history as it had been taught up to 1990 when they wrote this essay. Myths that exclude groups because of ethnicity, gender, or race should be rooted out and tossed aside for the planting of new ideas that aid society in understanding its culture and heritage. The myths of Texas are particularly overdue for thinning and replanting. I'll just leave this here for you to mull over for a second. A mild feeling of nausea is perfectly normal. Only when minorities believe their received culture commands the same respect as the dominant one will minorities demand full participation in society's educational and political goals. How paternalistic to assume that any group's goals are based on how college history departments present history. The Alamo myth still matters. It still defines Texans as white males and excludes women and minorities. 
you may have noticed that the only people who insist that Alamo believers are a bunch of racist white dudes are the very same people who define everyone by race, gender, and victim status. Most Texans define historical figures and themselves by what they do, not what they look like. The old emphasis on the virtuous Anglo male warriors resting the wilderness from the venal foes had one great strength. It was simple, but it still carried meaning and value. For many, tampering with the myth would destroy the fragile sense of community that protected Texans from the outside world. Therefore, the myth of the Alamo, in all its assorted forms, has been vigorously defended. If you need to pause the video now to swear at your computer screen or other device, that's perfectly normal. I'll wait. The professors here attempt to say that we only remember the Alamo because it insulates us. It makes us feel special, that without the Alamo, we lose our sense of Texas exceptionalism. They omit the inherent meaning and value it has to Texans and people all over the world who admire acts of bravery. As Paul Lack argues, we need new community studies of revolutionary Texas that use methods associated with new social history before the history of the state can escape the suffocating power of its heroes. Paul Lack was then a professor of history at McMurray University in Abilene. Five years after this was published, a and published his New Social History of the Texas Revolution. In sum, Calvert and Binger claimed minorities couldn't fully participate in society because we taught too much about the Alamo and the Alamo story represented slavery and discrimination and that the Alamo story and its kindred stories detracted from telling minority stories and that the Texas public hid behind the Alamo story to avoid participating in the outside world. Reasonable people know that spending more time on the Alamo siege than, say, a discussion of sexism in colonial Texas is the better course. But a group who wants to be emancipated from its heroes is not a reasonable group. In their 1990 plan, Calvert and Binger also explain how Texas history had become warped and tainted by terrible things like frontier values and San Jacinto and the Alamo and other non-inclusive, non-modern, useless 19th century stuff. And of course, J. Frank Doby, Walter Prescott Webb, and Roy Betacek, the foundational teachers of Texas history in the last century, were absolutely to blame. The 1990 essay complains that these men, saw the frontier as a source of positive values which were relevant to modern life and continued to be needed. Imagine looking at optimism, individualism, self-reliance, and fighting spirit and thinking that those are negative things. Then imagine discarding those lessons of the frontier because men of the 19th century didn't hold your 21st century views of minorities or women. Too frequently, the history of the state was left in the hands of those who wished to preserve the Anglo myth. Well, now the history of our state is in the hands of a bunch of mostly white men who need to paint all Anglos as oppressors and cancel out their historical achievements in the name of social justice. The family tree of many historians writing on Texas goes back in an almost straight line to Garrison, Ramsdale, Barker, Webb, and Doby. Inbreeding has ruined the vigor of the herd of Texas historians. Contemporary historians must attack the old ideas and the older purveyors of those ideas. Then they must step out of the shadow of the old myths and the giants who recounted the myths. It's worth pointing out here that academia is no less incestuous today. There are only so many universities and so many jobs at those universities where newly minted PhDs can seek employment. Doby, Barker, Ramsdell, their lineage is bad because they celebrated our history. Any ideas spawned from that lineage must be attacked and dismantled. Modern professors think that their departmental incest is A-OK -okay because their ideas are better and more equitable. They are more enlightened and virtuous than any teacher, writer, or historical figure who preceded them. Here's another reason why the professors in 1990 wanted to squash traditional history. Upward mobility. In the academic world, peer recommendation and approval is the currency of the land. So imagine how these guys felt when the rest of the country was doing this new thing, but Texas was sticking to her guns. Quoting from the essay, The fear of being identified as narrow and unsophisticated, as well as limits on salary and mobility attached to the tag Texas historian, still causes most of us to identify ourselves as historians in a broader construct of the South or the Gilded Age, 
rather than as historians of Texas. So yes, they chose and studied to be Texas historians, but then were embarrassed when their peers didn't view them as sophisticates. Since Walter Binger is now the chief historian of the Texas State Historical Association and the Summerlee Chair in Texas History at UT, I wonder if he's still embarrassed to be called a Texas historian. On the matter of why rancid, racist, traditional Texas history persisted in popular and academic writing for so long, these two Aggie professors had a lot to say. Clinging to past ways and past ideas is the simpler choice for those who write about the state. They ignore the rest of the historical profession rather than challenge the mindset of the home folk. The few breakthroughs in interpretation achieved in Texas history during the past 20 years may have occurred because of the increasing isolation in which historians work. They are free to think because they are unnoticed. When they are noticed, they're still not given freedom to think. Instead, zealots in the sons and daughters of the Republic seek to silence and intimidate them. Hey, remember being a sullen teenager and wanting your mom to leave you alone so you could write in your journal, but also desperately craving the attention of a particular in-group? That's what's going on here. Also, I want to give a shout out to you zealots, you SRT and DRT members out there known for being so intimidating. Time to get down to brass tacks. The how of the matter. How did Calvert and Binger plan to bring about this nirvana of diversity and inclusion with less Alamo, where they would finally receive the adulation and the money that they so obviously thought they deserved? Well, the answer is studies. You know, studies. Populate liberal arts colleges with black studies, women's studies, Latino studies. Studies, studies, studies. They wanted money for studies. And why? Because the more studies programs you have, the more practitioners of new social history you have. I'll let them tell you in their work. In short, there is a need for more funding for minority scholarship. A second phase in the evolution of minority history is often the launching of ethnic study programs. They've become less controversial and confrontational and have pioneered new social history studies in Texas and elsewhere. We badly need not only history in non-traditional fields such as women's history and Tejano history, but works in traditional fields with non-traditional biases. We need another look at the Alamo and at the Army of the Republic. This will require money for research time and public encouragement of university administrators and presses to support these new efforts. Funds for the support of history and its outreach to the public should come in part from public sources, but philanthropic foundations and concerned citizens should also be encouraged to support the writing of history. For example, there are few endowed chairs in Texas history in the state. Endowed chairs and special research funds distributed to various universities would infuse new energy into Texas studies. So that was the plan as it was laid out in 1990. So then what happened? Well, Everything that Calvert and Binger described in 1990 is, in fact, a reality today. There are now endowed chairs in Texas history at universities across the state, most of which are occupied by proponents of new social history. A new generation of professors are also proponents of new social history because they got their PhDs under people like Binger. And how did that whole studies thing work out for us in the Lone Star State? Well... It went swell. Departments of and degrees in studies abound. And at the very tippy top of the Texas history food chain is Walter Lewis Binger. Bob Calvert passed away in the year 2000. His handbook of Texas entry is replete with praise for his leadership in bringing new social history to Texas. But such a glowing biography comes as no surprise since Binger wrote the entry himself and he is the editor of the Handbook of Texas. Well, so what? You may be wondering. How does this impact me? I don't have kids in college. I'm not in college. It's a bunch of boring professors writing a bunch of boring stuff. I didn't subject you to this boring trip down academic memory lane for the fun of it. I figured if you understood what Binger's plans were back in 1990, you would better understand the gravity of what I'm about to say. 
The Texas State Historical Association has Walter Binger at its helm as their chief historian. Because he is chief historian, he is also the editor of the Handbook of Texas. I'll show you how Walter Binger impacts each of our daily lives. Do an internet search for, well, let's do Texas succession in the Civil War. Okay, the first result is from Wikipedia. Fine, let's look at the sources for this Wikipedia entry. The first one is the handbook's entry for Texas succession, written by Walter Binger. Ten of the 38 sources cited are TSHA sources. The fourth result down is the Handbook of Texas entry for Texas Succession, written by Binger. Please note that unlike Wikipedia, where you can view a log of all the changes made to an article, you cannot view a change log to Handbook of Texas entries to see what has been modified, when, and by whom. When asked, a very polite TSHA employee informed me that While they do keep an internal log of changes made to handbook entries, it is not viewable by the public. The fifth search result is an article in the Texas Almanac, a publication also owned by the Texas State Historical Association. So there you have it. The sad and scary truth is that the Texas State Historical Association and a small group of professors control what millions of people see when they seek information about Texas and her history. The textbook used in our colleges to teach Texas history, that was authored by Bob Calvert in 1990, revised by his acolytes, and still used today. Of its 512 pages, only two are used to cover the Alamo and Goliad. Binger and company also involved themselves with the Board of Education and how history is taught in primary schools. So how'd they get away with it? Well, they set forth a plan and they quietly brought it to fruition. Only academics read what academics write. They write for each other, after all. And Texans had grown used to trusting the Texas State Historical Association. And we've continued to blindly support it because we genuinely want to preserve our history. And that's what they claim that they're doing. It's a pity we didn't realize sooner what brand of history they were selling. Well, now you know. Next up on the Unmakers of Texas History, we'll look into what Mr. Binger has had to say about the Lone Star State since 1990. We'll also look in on some of his fellow travelers at other universities. Until then, this is Michelle signing off, reminding you of what matters. God in Texas, y'all.